This conference will now be recorded. All right, JB, first off, genuinely appreciate you jumping on the podcast. Excited to have this conversation. Well, Brett, in your own words, let's, uh, let's get after it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, that's, that's good. Um, so for those that don't know you, um, you know, give, uh, give the audience a little bit of your background and your journey to your new current role with the Rapids. Sure. So for the folks who might not be familiar with me, my name is James Bryant. I go by JB. Uh, originally from about an hour south of London um, and, and grew up uh, in London uh, kind of throughout sort of the course of my childhood and uh, moved over to the U.S. Uh, when I was 18. Uh, my, uh, my father is, uh, uh, is English. My mother is from uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. So uh, I kind of moved over to the U.S., uh, when I was 18, went to Elon University uh, down in North Carolina. And uh, throughout my whole college career, Brett, I was really focusing on being a soccer coach. I thought that was kind of sort of be my sort of uh, route that I wanted to take. And uh, found quite quickly that that was going to be more of a hobby uh, than necessarily a, a full-time career. So um, I actually did uh, my first internship out of college uh, at the National Soccer Coaches Association of America, uh, which is uh, kind of where I met uh, my, my good friend and, uh, and my, my direct sort of boss, uh, Jacob Hanselman. We used to be interns together back in the day. And uh, I took my first entry-level sales position with Sporting KC uh, around the time of their new stadium and, and their new brand uh, image that they have uh, going from the, the Wizards to Sporting KC. Uh, and then was trying to get myself back to uh, the East Coast. Uh, my girlfriend and, and wife now um, was moving to New York and was able to get an opportunity to move to New York and go and spend most of my selling career, Brett, with the New York Yankees in, a, in a, several different roles, kind of first and foremost, as account executive role, and then was the first individual on that team to be a part of the retention sales staff. So my role there was to really negotiate long-term contracts with some of our premium clientele uh, that had been with the organization, and then ended uh, with the, the Yankees as a premium sales consultant uh, and, and continued to work in that sort of a capacity. Uh, and then really about two and a half years ago, uh, I got a phone call from Jacob Hanselman asking sort of my interest level in coming to uh, the Rapids and coming back to Major League Soccer. Uh, I, I, I'd always had a, a passion for training and development uh, due to the fact of my own training and development that I received at Sporting KC under uh, Greg Allen and Jake Reed. So, um, and I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to, to team up with uh, a very close buddy of mine who, who, I, who I think the world of, um, and really start this academy from, from scratch um, and, and be able to develop and, and create an academy that you know is, is one of the top, if not the best, uh, in, in Major League Soccer when it comes to sales, uh, sales development training. Uh, so I've been the inside sales manager for uh, around two and a half years and, and just actually uh, a few weeks ago, Brett was um, taking on a new role called the uh, Senior Manager of Sales Development. And uh, I, I will say that there are a couple of things that we still need to tie up and kind of and really define on what that means. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, it's about continuously growing not only our inside sales reps, but also our account executive reps, uh, our group reps, our, our service team and really making sure that we're giving them a platform at the account executive level uh, to really continue to grow into more of the senior roles and, and for the folks who are wanting to get into the management roles as well. Uh, and then from the management side, really kind of helping them uh, from a data and analytical standpoint uh, and being sort of a, a, a someone who they can kind of bounce ideas off and, and really help with the, the specific one-on-one -on -one development of their reps. So, um, so excited to be on the podcast and, 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 and always excited to have conversations with folks who really have a true emphasis and care about the development of sales reps within our industry. Well, appreciate it. And, and I think it's something, you know, you and I both certainly have in common. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about with your new role, because I think it's so interesting and, you know, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on it 
And we were talking a little bit before we, we started recording that, you know, it's in a lot of ways very similar to the role that I had when I was with the Columbus crew. So can you talk about what that gap is between the support that an inside sales rep gets and the support that an account executive gets? Because, you know, it's almost like, you know, you trade up an inside sales rep and you're just like, well, you're good. <laughs> Go figure this out once yeah. we've graduated you. Yeah, so I think, um, so, so that was kind of, a, I think, just having conversations with, with our staff. Um, you know, we've had a lot of great individuals come through our academy, Brett. And, uh, I, you know, I was an inside sales for, for, for an entire year. And I think uh, what you're seeing is you're seeing folks who are coming into the industry and they're spending, you know, nine months, six months, some even three months uh, within inside sales. And I think... You know, for the inside sales managers who are listening, you know, on this podcast, I think you know we we sometimes are um, are, are a little bit sort of worry and concerned, and, and really asking ourselves, has this person truly been able to you know develop you know to make sure that they're taking on that much larger role, uh, and and obviously ultimately that much larger revenue goal that is associated with the job, um, and are we actually putting that individual? in the best situation to succeed at that role uh, now sometimes obviously just due to uh you know promotions and people moving on you know a lot of those opportunities at the ae level come i would say probably a little bit earlier than than you know ideally we would want those to those to happen and i think what we found is that um, you know, not only you know do we have inside sales reps moving to the account executive role earlier, I think, than probably previous kind of years um, and, and when we were in inside sales, but how do we make sure that we don't have that? And, and using sort of your words, like, oh, you know, you're an AE now, like off you go by yourself. And I think that's where uh, we at the Rapids have really kind of clearly defined, like, okay. All of our training is going to be just as we're going to be just as important at the AE level as it is the inside sales to ultimately grow, continue to grow their careers, even though that they're still so early on in that career themselves. Well, I think it's I mean, and you can you can tell me if you agree or disagree, but I also think, you know, ultimately it will help retention, too, uh, because a lot of times what you see is account executives start to drift away because they they start to feel like they're on an island, almost whether or not they're producing. Um, and, and they don't feel as connected organizationally as they did when they were an inside sales rep, which is which is oftentimes crazy. Uh, and I think, you know, this opportunity to continue to create this developmental path and developmental growth and for them to feel like they're continuing to grow as sales reps um, is going to be absolutely critical to them staying with the team. Because we know the difference between, you know, what a first year rep brings in and what a third year rep brings in. But one of the things that we often miss is a lot of times between a third and a fourth year rep, we can't keep that rep. They feel like they need to become a manager or worse, they start to flatline as a salesperson. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the funny thing is, is that we're getting to a point, you know, and, and we probably see it in the industry more so that, that, than ever is that first year rep is also an account executive where I think traditionally we've always liked for them to be uh, an inside sales rep. Um, I know a lot of the AEs would probably hate me saying this, um, but you know the, the other thing that we, you know, we don't want to happen is we always talk about how inside sales is is one of the toughest jobs that you will have uh, in in your sports career. Obviously, you're at the the bottom of the totem pole, um, and, and you're sort of really sort of establishing yourself and your brand. Uh, and then what we don't want happening, uh, and it kind of ties into your retention piece, is like we don't want these reps to feel like they've made it. Yeah. And um, which I think is something that every team and every manager sees. And I think it's how do we make sure that that entry level sales rep, even though they are six months, one year, year and a half into their role, they don't have this uh, they don't have this feeling of, oh, I've made it out of inside sales um, and, and, and now I'm now I'm coasting and now I'm now I'm good. I've, I've now established myself as a uh, as a high level producer. So what we're doing is we're really kind of making sure that we're continuing to challenging that rep uh, and have the same mentality that they had in inside sales and wanting to get out of inside sales and to grow their careers uh, at that account executive level. And we're asking ourselves, well, why can't we do that for an AE wanting to be a senior AE or a senior AE wanting to be an entry level sales manager with that same tenacity that they probably had in inside sales? 
I love that. And, you know, I think, you know, when I, you know, when you start hearing this with your director or VP hat on, I know this because I've heard other people say, they'll be like, well, why do we have to have managers then? Why can't we just have, you know, JB come in and run development for all of our reps and we're good. But I do think there's a huge difference between, you know, what you're hoping to accomplish and still having someone in charge of each one of those business areas, making sure that the day-to-day -day tactics of those areas, the execution of those areas, the, the drive towards the goal of those areas needs to be supported from the top down while you're kind of pushing it from the bottom up, right? C correct, yeah. I, I would say that, uh, I say that was fair. You know, I think my role from kind of a, my relationship with my, with my managers it, I, that, that I work with is not necessarily me overseeing that department. It, it's basically being that one-two punch. And I think what, um, you know, my, my strengths are, are probably more on the side of, okay, are we, do we have the right processes in place to, to make sure that uh, our reps are the, you know, are, are doing the best that they can. And it's, and it's kind of giving the, the managers of each department, making sure that they have their game plan uh, and, and really sort of being in the trenches with that individual department that they run. But for me to kind of help them sort of, and, and Jacob and Emily and, and, and all the other folks who, who are part of our management staff is to, how do we just make sure that the quality control is there and we're keeping ourselves and we're keeping our reps accountable to what were what the game plan is and how we're going to execute it. So to, to put this in a, you know, in the other American football terms, I, I would kind of deem myself as more of a quality control coach. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a great way um, to, to think about it. I love that. And, you know, I also think that, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that, that we see is that teams place a lot of resources. If they're going to decide to do an inside sales program, they place a lot of resources to growing and developing their inside sales manager in a way that they don't necessarily do for necessarily a group sales manager or a season ticket sales manager. So can you talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you can, you know, this type of role can help with when you start looking at managers themselves? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of the time, um, if, if most of the time the individual is either someone who maybe has become an inside sales manager before or and then moved on to a, uh, a different part of the, the business. But a lot of the time what we've seen and, at the, you know, we're in this situation right now where our, our group sales manager, our service manager and our season ticket manager are actually all individuals that had fantastic careers as sales reps uh, here at the Rapids. Um, and, and I think that it, I can't stress how important that is and, and that's certainly helped me develop as a manager having folks who have sold for the team that they actually are, are yep. managing now. Um, but at the same time, I think it's just being able to help them grow with kind of looking at it from a training perspective and I think one of the biggest challenges that anybody faces when you go from a, a sales rep to a manager is how do you make sure that you train your reps not the way that you did, um, but kind of going back to the basics and foundations and helping them grow your reps certain style of, of selling. I think that's the number one thing that we constantly find folks do is they struggle with the fact of, okay, now I'm a manager, now my job is to try and train my team the way I sold. And that couldn't be so far from the truth. It's about how do you make sure that you really understand everybody's sales process and everybody's style, and then being able to put a game plan in place that is going to actually make sure that that is the most beneficial way of going about their day to day. Uh, so, so I think kind of what my relationship is going to be like with with our managers, and and obviously it's only been a few weeks now, it is is helping them with that um, and helping them sort of get back to the basics and. And uh, for folks who maybe are not familiar with how the Rappers have done this year, um, you know the, the team performance certainly hasn't been uh, hasn't been a help for us. So we're we're really having to go back to making sure that we're doing the simple things right, uh, and, and making sure that we have our sales process buttoned up to a point where, you know, we we can focus on what we can control. Well, and I think the, the real value of that conversation, you know, if we're, if we're putting a bow on it, is to be able to talk to a manager and say, hey, listen, I know that you've sold season tickets for the Colorado Rapids better than I have. I have spent more time training reps than you have. How do we combine those two skill sets to make sure that we create the best possible um, arena for our, our reps to continue to grow and develop? 
using the strengths that you have as a season ticket salesperson for the Rapids and my strengths in terms of growing, develop, teaching, and training. C couldn't agree with you more. That's great, <laughs> great way to marry, marry those, two, uh, those two areas. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about sales. So um, you've sold soccer, you've sold baseball, you're managing soccer now. You know, one of my favorite things, you know, when, when we take a look and have these conversations is I always call it perspective. Um, and so you've obviously got a pretty unique perspective um, what are some of those things where you see across both sports that are some truisms um, about sales that are just regardless of what you're selling, the, these are the truest ways to find success? So I think probably the first thing that comes to mind is that your process never changes or it shouldn't change. Uh, I think, you know, when I went from base, when I went from, sorry, from soccer to baseball uh, and obviously from the Kansas City market to the New York market, Mm -hmm. I had this I had this perception that I was going to have to change uh, the way I talked, the way I the, the, my sales process, how I interacted with people, uh, you know what I would say on the phone. And you know for the first couple of months at the at the Yankees, uh, I was I was certainly probably not excelling. And I think that was that was probably the reason why is because I thought I needed to do something different. Um, than what I was doing in Kansas City, and uh, and I was having success in Kansas City. And once I realized that my sales process didn't have to change in the slightest in terms of my my, my opening, my setting agenda, my 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 level of questioning, my my recommendation, asking for the sale. Once I realized that that really doesn't change from you know market to market, from sport to sport. Uh, that's kind of when I actually really started to kind of get my feet uh, kind of on the ground at, at the Yankees. And, um, you know, a, a British guy selling baseball. I mean, I, I always joke about that, but, you know, it's, you know, they certainly didn't hire me for my baseball knowledge or acumen. Um, and, and they certainly brought, brought me in for a specific reason, which was because of my success at Kansas City uh, and, and also just my, the process that I had executed uh, through that time. So I think, the, the biggest the biggest thing that folks have to understand is that you do not have to change the sales process uh, um, really at all from from team to team. I think what the drastic change is is going to be probably more so the the level of questioning um, just based on the the sport itself and also the objections that you're going to find. Obviously, yeah. in baseball, you're going to have a lot more of the you know, the 81 baseball games for the Yankees, it was more the cost of the seat, uh, but, um, and obviously the New York market as well. But those are the things that you, you tweak um, and, and maybe your responses to certain, uh, certain, certain answers that you get from your clients might have to be adjusted. Um, but I would say that's probably the, the, the biggest thing that uh, is drastically different is just more of the, the situational market um, yeah. objections that you get, and also the sport and the, just the intricacies that kind of compare soccer to baseball to, to hockey to, to basketball. Yeah, I, I'd call those the nuances of, of market and sport, I think, are, are the only differences. And I couldn't agree with you more about a process. You know, but process is one of those things that gets talked a lot about in sales, but can be a very vague concept. So to you, what is a sales process? So I think it's just your, it's a clear, definite journey of how you're going to interact with your customer. Um, and, and what we do here at the Academy is I think, you know, we do, we teach folks, you know, who quite frankly, some have never picked up a phone before and, you know, it's to how you pick up a phone all the way to going to setting the appointment um, and, and uh, or closing the sale. So we have a very strict process and you know it's not drastically different from the national cell center which obviously uh, you're very familiar with and, and have been part of but i think it's really important to to have a process because what it does from the sales and development side brett is it allows us to really focus on areas that the, the individual might need improvement on yep. so because we have our six stages we're able to identify uh, specific stages that maybe a rep is, is is struggling on or really excelling at and then being able to share that as either best practice or, or even a, a coaching moment for the rest of the team. So not only do, do we think that 
you know, a process is in place from the foundational standpoint of things. Um, you know, I would say we have a script to start off with, but our goal is to have the rep generally sort of have and, and find their own flow and personality. So really the off process is a foundational thing that allows someone to kind of go through the journey with a customer. And then from the manager side of things, it allows us to actually identify strengths and weaknesses a lot better than just by saying, uh, okay, have a crack at it or, or just go and wing it or, or, or see what you want to do. Um, so that's kind of our process and why we believe this. It, it, it's so true. Um, not only to the sales, uh, kind of in terms of communicating with them, but also your follow-up procedure um, and all the other intricacies that you have within the sales process. I love to think about the sales process like it's Waze, right? If you're familiar with that app or Google Maps or whatever it is that you, you use, it's just the most efficient way to get from point A to point B, from the beginning of a conversation to the end of the conversation. And, you know, you can certainly, you know, bring whoever you want in the car. You can talk about whatever you want in the car. You can play whatever music you want in the car. You should customize that process with every single person you talk to. But you should also, you should always know what do I need to do to start and what do I need to do to get to the end um, most efficiently. Um, and, and I think that's simply when I think about process, which I think aligns very much with what you were saying. Yeah, and, and, and just to add on that, we actually were talking about this in our, in our training yesterday with our reps was, you know, I asked, I asked the team, I was like, why do you think we put these processes in place? And, and and we got some really intriguing answers and you know some thought it was just more of a well you know you guys are just telling us this but really Brett you know one of the reasons why we put so many processes in place is because we don't want the rep to even think about that we want them to be thinking about so many other things yep. um, outside of just okay when do I need to follow up this person when do I need to call this person so we're putting these in place for them so they don't so they can actually spend some of their brain matter on more important things and more in-depth things. So we, we kind of look at it from a standpoint of we're trying to take more off their plate so they don't even have to think about some of these things to where they can really focus their, their time and energy on um, much more important things and allow the managers to put this process in place uh, to, for them to excel. Like the most important thing, genuinely connecting with the other person on the phone over the sport you're selling. And I think, you know, that gets lost a lot when you do too much scripting and you move away too much from process or, or teach a process but don't work to define the process for reps is they become very robotic when the whole point of demonstrating a process, to your point, is to have reps not have to overthink um, to allow them to know where to go. So along the way, they, they can be as connected to the person they're talking to as possible. Totally agree. All right, so you and Jacob Hanselman, who, who we both have a connection to, are about to go on this crazy, crazy, crazy recruiting road trip. And you know, you know, having been someone that, you know, developed a lot of the sales training forms that you see at NBA teams and Major League Soccer teams and Major League Baseball teams and NFL teams and et cetera now, you know I'm up for a crazy um, recruiting and, and going out and competing for and finding the best possible talent. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? And then we can talk a little bit about, you know, some of the recruiting and managing stuff. Yeah, so um, so, so like most uh, most great ideas, they start at a bar. Um, <laughs> and this was, a, uh, th th this was an idea that I, I remember vividly. We were sitting in a bar, Louis, um, just uh, a few miles outside of the stadium having a drink, uh, I believe, on like a Thursday. And we were talking about sort of our, our next sort of incoming inside sales class. And we said, okay, like how, how like what is our strategy for, for, for this January 2018 class? And, um, and we came up with this idea and we thought, what about we get on campus? Um, because traditionally, as you know, Brett, from, from, from working on the team side and, and, training, and training teams is – a lot of the interview process is very um, mundane. It's a very, uh, you know, you apply on teamwork online, um, you maybe get a phone call and then maybe a Skype interview. Uh, and then maybe some, if you're, if you're local, maybe you get the, the, the in-person face-to-face. Um, and, we, and we kind of wanted to flip the script on that. And what we decided to do, we thought, okay, we've got some great relationships with, um, with, with some schools that we, typically sort of recruit and hire from. Um, and we thought, what about we 
go ahead and get on campus and we give students the opportunity and get a glimpse of what it would be like to be an inside sales representative with the Colorado Rapids. And not only, and I think it really has two goals and, and, and why we're doing this road trip is first and foremost, um, it allows us to evaluate candidates at a much higher level. And we feel a lot more confident that they, uh, they can pick up information quickly and, and ultimately have a passion for what we do. Uh, and then the second part of it kind of ties into the first part with, I think the, the, the biggest concern and what kind of keeps inside sales managers up at night is whether this individual is truly wanting to be in sales for the right reasons. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, I, I, I wrote an article about, you know, why the foot in the door is the worst thing that you can say in a sports sales interview. And I think that's the number one thing is, are we actually generally getting folks who want to have a career in sports sales or folks who just like the idea of working in sports? So from, from this road trip, which is a five hour like interactive sort of workshop, uh, we use improv, we do games, and we kind of teach them like a real 30,000 foot view of our, of our sales combine, um, or sorry, of our sales process. And we have found that we, we have evaluated candidates a lot better to where last year we were actually having four individuals um, who we picked up from the road trip uh, and who are part of our who were part of our January class. But I think probably just as exciting is that we've had over 150 candidates go through our combines uh, last year. And I would say about 30 to 35 of them have either received a full-time position or an internship opportunity after they've done this combine. And so many of them have mentioned, you know, hey, hey JB, I, I went into your combine not 100% knowing if sales was for me. And I'm so glad I did this because it, it solidified that I wanted to do this. Or on the 180, folks saying, you know what, I'm glad I did this because I know this is what I don't want to do. So yeah. I think we're just, we're just trying to get on campus to give people exposure to like what we do. Um, and it's really not the, the, the stigma of like that sleazy sales rep, which I think a lot of college students might, might be perceiving us as um, just from the outside looking in. Well, I want, to, I want to hold on that point again, too, because I think, you know, we have a lot of inside sales managers who, when they're recruiting, be like, oh, I want to completely discard them if they don't say that they eat sales for breakfast or blah, blah, blah. You know, and a lot of times, you know, a, a college student, right, it says, well, you know, I want to get into marketing or I want to get into PR or community relations um, because they have that very different idea about what a salesperson is, right? They they were there when, you know, a, a, a Cutco rep walked into their house or, you know, they were on the lot when a sleazy salesperson tried to sell their, their parents a used car, right? And then, and, or they see all this representatives on TV or in, in the marketplace. Um, what do you do to try to make sure that when a rep leaves there, they have a very clear understanding of what a sales rep does in a far more positive light? So I think, I think first and foremost, it's just cut you know, I think the the stigma is is that we uh, that that salespeople are just manipulating or, or cramming product down people's throats. And I think when we go through our sales process, Brett, um, I think the, the light bulbs start slowly going off as we kind of get a further and further in our sales process that we teach on these combines. And and what they find is is that a lot of what we sell is is based on justification of what the the client has said um but also finding the best fit and we all we all know that you know you're you're going to make a lot more you're going to make several more sales by focusing on what actually is the best fit for the client and continue to actually retain their business moving forward than just trying to sell the the highest level product and and, and throwing product down people's throats and, and generally thinking that the, your product might not actually be the best fit for every single person because we know we know right off the bat that it's not. Um, but I think our goal is to try and get individuals on this uh, on this combine and our reps that we currently have is to really focus on the fact of okay, can we challenge someone to think differently um, and and be able to kind of see the value in utilizing sports tickets for their business 
sports tickets for their family. Um, but understanding that at the, the key essence of it is really the fact of we are just trying to find a solution for that individual. And if we can find it, we want to make sure that we accommodate that. Uh, but if we cannot find a solution, then it's time to just to move on and move on to the next person. Yeah, absolutely. And so can you talk about from an evaluating standpoint, what the advantages are of having this, this level of interaction with the, the reps, you know, having been someone that, you know, pioneered the sales training forms, I'm a huge believer that what you guys are doing is absolutely the right thing. Um, and it's made me a better recruiter, but can you talk about why that is specifically? So I think, you know, typically just kind of set the sort of the scene for what a combine looks like. So we probably have about 20 to 30 individuals who are going through this combine uh, at once. So first and foremost, uh, it's kind of a, a group style kind of interview. And clearly, you know, we have, we give the candidates uh, a lot of opportunities to, to volunteer, uh, to, to step up and be the one in the group. Uh, so we're really kind of looking for those those people who enjoy kind of separating themselves from from the pack, kind of more the go getters, the entrepreneurs of the group, um, the people who are okay with failure and, and see failure as a way of kind of improving their skill set and, and mindset as well. So um, and then obviously we can see body language. We can see if you know someone is actually really engaged, asking questions, or are they just kind of sitting there just thinking, oh, well, you know, this is just another sort of sales training, you know, uh, program, and I'm just going to slap this on my resume. Uh, so we can we can find a lot of verbal and nonverbal cues that we typically can't see in a um, in an interview setting. Uh, and then also, um, it allows us to really kind of see, can somebody take in that information and then apply it to uh, uh, to, to actually sort of what they've been trained on. And so we're kind of looking for, and, and really for anybody who's listening to this and, and is thinking about coming to our combine, like we're looking for some go-getters. We're looking for some people who are not afraid to fail. Uh, people who uh, really have a passion for um, trying to be the best version of themselves. And that's ultimately why we decided to do this combine was to, you know, be able to give people that exposure um, to really kind of separate themselves from the competition and really get that leg up over folks who are not attending these types of events. That's great. And so if you're gonna give advice to that person who's trying to get a leg up, who's going into one of these recruiting forums or opportunities, what advice would you give you know, that college student um, when, as it pertains to, you know, how would you stand out in, in, some, in like a cattle call like this? Yeah, so you know, we, we, always, start, we always start the, uh, the com with, with a good saying that has kind of hopefully uh, slowly sort of uh, uh, progressed throughout the, the industry is what we call bring the juice, which is bring, bring the energy. Like you are in a interview setting uh, and you've got 19 other people in this room who want to be in the sports industry as well. And if you're not willing to step up and engage and bring the energy and bring the excitement, then the chances are you won't do that when you actually get into the industry. So this is an opportunity for you to separate yourself. And there are some people who will take that opportunity and there are some people who will just let others take it, uh, take it away from them. So I would say for anybody who's, who's looking to get into the industry and come to our combine, like bring the juice, uh, bring your, bring your a game. Um, and, and you'll, be sure to you know feel very very comfortable with the five hours of training that you learned that that's going to really separate you from any other application or interviewer that uh, that you're talking with and i mean i'd also tell them and i think going back to the other one too you know having done this before is go fail right just yeah you know, you know bring, <laughs> bring the juice but like like fail huge like throw yourself out there show that you're trying to learn show that you're trying to apply um, you know, I, I think some of the people that have been the most no-brainer hires have been some of the people that have failed most gloriously um, when, when, they've, when they've gone out there and put themselves out there. But we want to see those people that are willing to, you know, throw themselves into the brick wall to try to figure out how to take it down. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it, it's a very daunting, uh, very daunting environment, uh, you know, for a lot of these college students. 
I mean, I mean, we're not expecting them to really pick up the sales process in five hours um, and, and be masters of it. But you know, are they having fun actually trying to, yep. uh, to, to trying to actually learn it and, and be able to try and pick it up as quick as possible? So you know, we're, we're certainly not expecting people to. You know, and, and this is kind of, you know, going back to our development uh, conversation, it's like, you know, you're not going to sort of pick up sales in a month, three months, six months, or, or even several years. It, it's that constant kind of learning and continuously improving. And I think when we see candidates at these combines who are really engaged in learning um, and improving themselves, then that's the type of person that we're looking for. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out sales and I write a website that's supposed yeah. to make it out, right? I think, you know, the, 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 the process is changing and evolving all the time, but I think what you want is to find those reps that are going to be as adaptive as possible and are going to be as open as possible to learning and growing and developing. Absolutely agree. Um, and so let's, let's flip that. Let's say these people get hired um, by you all or they get hired by a team. You know, what's the biggest piece of advice that you'd give them when, when, when they get into their first day in the office? So I think just, I think first and foremost, you know, you've got to take, a, you've got to take a step back and think, um, you know, for a few minutes and say, you know, what, what a fantastic opportunity that you've been presented. I mean, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who want to work in the sports industry in, in really any capacity. So um, I would probably take one minute to kind of look around and kind of put your feet on the ground and say, okay, we're here. And then that now, then the second moment you should be thinking is, okay, now the work starts. Um, because your inside sales career um, can really define the rest of your, your career in this industry. Um, that's why when I was an inside sales rep working under uh, Greg Allen and Jake Reed was, you know, I, I was able to get the, the 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 training that has allowed me to you know continue my career in this in this industry, um, and that's kind of why I wanted to be an inside sales manager. Brett was understanding you know that those guys changed my life when I was uh, when I was 21 years old, and I, I take my job extremely seriously to to know that there are folks who travel across the country to take this entry level position. Um, to, 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 to learn from the, to learn from the folks here at the Rapids to ultimately take their careers, you know, whether it be here at the Rapids within Cronky Sports and Entertainment or another team um, around, uh, around the leagues. So I think it's, you know, take a deep breath, um, know that you've got a fantastic journey uh, in front of you. You'll have some, some highs, you'll have some lows, but uh, in, in, in enjoy the journey because uh, I think yeah, you're going to be surrounded by some fantastic people and 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 hopefully mentors that will uh, that will be with you for the rest of your life. And so I know you've mentioned a few people along the way, um, and, and you mentioned mentors. Um, and I think it's so important that you find some people that are you know supportive of of you in your career. Um, and it's equally supportive to find those people that that drive you and motivate you and to look at leaders and say, you know, if I become a leader, if I want to become a better salespeople, here are some characteristics from there. Who are some of those people that have motivated you to to get where you are today? And what was it specifically about them that that made them stand out to you as either salespeople or leaders? So I think obviously the um you know, you know, the two from a from a business standpoint of things and my career itself, you know, have to go back to, you know, the Sporting KC days under uh, under Greg Allen being my inside sales manager, who is now the, the vice president uh, over there at SKC. And then Jake Reed, who was uh, my director of ticket sales, who, who's now the president of the club. Um, you know, I you know, I, I look at them and think, you know, they I had no sales experience when I first started at Sporting KC. Um, I was just a, a, a kid from England who, who really was kind of a little bit lost, um, but they clearly saw something in me that allowed and to give me the, the, the tools and the platform to really succeed in this role. Um, and I think, you know, you know, Greg, uh, uh, Greg and Jake are, are folks who I still in, in constant communication with and, and some of the go to guys when I have, um, you know, questions about sort of my career, but, but also that, you know, I, I, I would definitely, you know, have that relationship with them that I can go grab a beer with them. And I think that's probably 
uh, a, a real key aspect of the of a mentor mentee relationship is like is this someone who you generally can you know get to know on a personal level and i've always thought that jake and uh greg ha have cared about me um not only as just as a as a sales rep you know when i was working for them but also as just a, a as an individual uh as well and, and someone who you know that they generally care about and i think that's why we had such a great environment at, at skc um, and, well, and, and to call them out real quick, you know, um, there, there are a few people in sports that have obviously had the success in terms of growing what they've grown um, and sustained it the way that they have, which is which is unique. But one of the things that always stood out to me was, you know, when I was at the National Sales Center, they flew out to meet those people all the time. I think that was one thing was they were very serious about who they were going to bring in to represent their team uh, and their and their colors at all times. And that was always something just to add. I don't know what you said that that always stuck out to me about Jake and Greg. Yeah. So, no, absolutely. And, you know, and I think, uh, you know, I think uh, another person, you know, is obviously Jacob, you know, uh, Jacob and I, you know, um, we are, you know, even though that uh, I, I report to him, you know, he's, he's one of my closest buddies. Um, but, you know, I think something really comforting is that he has been an inside sales manager as well. So, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have, you know, a, a friend, you know, working in the same company who's actually done what I've done before at that level has been an inside sales manager, both at the, at the crew and, and the Sacramento King. So, you know, we, we're able to bounce off a lot of ideas and, and, and be able to uh, really kind of understand sort of some of the things that he learned when he was an inside sales manager. Um, and then, and then allow me to really kind of, understand that you know we are certainly two different people um uh but you know i think we have a lot of the same philosophy uh and, and ways that we go about executing it so i think it's been a, a really nice uh, uh really nice combination as well um and, and i have to also kind of give a shout out to, to emily mcguire our, our our vice president who's really kind of allowed me to kind of just run sort of you know kind of the you know the academy sort of that ic fit and she's kind of given me that full full blessing to really run sort of our you know our academy that we see fit um which i know is a very you know i i'm not entirely sure if if every single organization would be like that so i, I have to you know J jacob and emily have been fantastic people to work for as they've allowed me to kind of really kind of uh dictate kind of what we want this academy to look like from the sales and development side of things um, and then I would say kind of personally on kind of personal, um, you know, I think it kind of just has to go back to, you know, my, my friends and family, uh, you know, I'm the first, I'm the first individual to graduate from college from my family. Um, you know, I live, you know, 5,000 miles away from my family as well. Um, so, you know, I kind of going back to sort of what's my why it's, you know, it's making sure that I'm doing it for you know, my, my family back in England and, and everybody who I grew up with um, and, uh, and also my family as well, you know, me and my wife and putting myself in a, putting ourselves in a, in the best position, um, you know, for, for, for the family, uh, ultimately uh, trumps all. I love that. And I think that, you know, that bleeds into, you know, the, the last two questions that I ask on, on each one of these podcasts is, you know, that first one is, you know, I, I know you like me are, are, are pretty near into our, our marriage career uh, as it stands. And, you know, for, for you, you know, especially being an inside sales manager with the amount of responsibility you've had creating something and growing something, you know, I know how many hours that can, that can, that can lead to being in the office and, you know, working events and working nights. Um, you know, how do you create a, a, a such an incredible positive work-life balance? That's been one thing that's always impressed me about you is, is the positive attitude um, and the life-affirming attitude a lot of times that, that you take towards the role in the job? So, you know, th th this is a really interesting question, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of, uh, I'm going to sort of take this a different direction. I, I personally believe, Brett, that there is no such thing as work-life balance. Um, I think probably the best word that I use is rhythm. I think there's a work, work, uh, work personal life rhythm. And what I mean by that is that, you know, when I think of balance, I'm thinking it's 50-50. Um, and, and as we all know, this industry is not, uh, is never 50-50. There are going to be times where you're going to be 90% on, on one thing and you're going to be 10% on the other thing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would say that I try and do my best to have a work-life rhythm. 
Um, you know, when I'm in the office, you know, I am, you know, 100% go. Um, but then when I'm out of the office and what I train my reps on is when we are on, we're on. And when we're off, we're off. Um, and, and, and don't sort of get sort of in that gray area, um, you know, too much. Uh, but yes, it's an absolute, I think it's an absolute challenge for anybody uh, knowing that we are working on, you know, hours that typically folks are, you know, are spending those hours kind of in their leisure time. That's kind of when we're on. So I, I think the, the idea is just really making sure that you have a clear understanding of kind of, you know, making sure that you prioritize everything in the moment like what is what what needs to get done now and when i'm at work it is all about my team um you know and and that's and that's my number one when i'm outside of the office it, it's all about you know my my wife and and my family and my friends um but i think it's also just making sure and and you know i think this is kind of why i have to credit sort of uh my wife is as as obviously uh, not only is she my wife but she's also ceo of team bryant is because she allows, you know, she understands sort of the the, the sacrifices that, uh, that that sometimes I've had to make, you know, for that. Um, and and I know that I would I would I would be half the man, and, and and my career would be half as successful if I didn't have someone like her beside me. Um, but it's about understanding that I, I personally believe it's very difficult to balance everything. I think you've just got to make sure that the rhythm is in place. And, and, and being able to understand that there are going to be ebbs and flows in both your work and personal life, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the course of the season. I love, I love the changing of the word to rhythm too, because I think if you're, if you're looking to strike a balance and you're going to work in sports business, you're, you're going to come up short 10 times out of 10. Yes. Um, and, <laughs> and, so, and so finding that opportunity to enjoy the people around you, uh, but also to create something outside of that um I, I love the way that that you describe that because you you do have to have those two personalities because i do think sometimes um you know we, we do work a lot in sports but you know a young sales rep tends to get so tied to their inside sales class and they tend to get so tied that they forget to create something specific outside of that and whatever outside of that you know outs in the season it could be that five percent right but you know outside of the season um, it, it could take a, a much bigger percentage, but you do need to create something outside of what your office is. Because if you get too tied to it, then the highs become too high and the lows become too low and it'll start to throw everything off filter. Absolutely. And that's and that's kind of where you create the burnout. That's kind of where we that's where sort of you start having the retention, um, you know, issues within an organization. And then ultimately that leads to, you know, potentially putting in people in positions that maybe they're not 100% ready to take. And then it's just that cycle over and over and over again. Which is vicious. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. we've seen way too many good people lose themselves in, in, in that cycle. And I yeah. think the more that, that we understand that and we can help support that um, is, is really critical because a lot of these people are doing it for their first time ever. And we tend to forget that, right? Like, you know, college is one thing and maybe we give too much credit to college moving somewhere and starting a, and starting a job um, is, is an entirely different beast. Yeah, no, no. And uh, um, it, it's, it's so funny how we're tying it up. And I think that, you know, this relates to, you know, the article that you've just posted. Um, and, and, and I think there's a, that there's a huge emphasis on that right now and, and making sure that's our, um, that, that, that everybody in our industry, you know, has, has the support they need to, to excel. Um, and, you know, we we have a lot of you know I think I was having a conversation actually with one of our sponsorship guys uh, yesterday. He was recommending me a, a, a podcast, and he said, you know, it's really fascinating when college students their first job. You know, one of the biggest challenges and things that they face is that this is the first time in their career that they are not with their peers. Yeah. Um, they have, you know, you spend your entire college career with people who are on the same uh, same sort of part of the journey of life. You're with people who are your age, they're going through college, they're doing activities. Then all of a sudden you come into an organization and you have folks who are married, people with kids, uh, people who are, you know, in higher positions than you. And it's, it, it's, it's kind of adjusting to that lifestyle of being surrounded by folks who are not the same as you because you've yeah. spent your entire collegiate career and also your educational life 
spending 90% of the time with people exactly like you. And then all of a sudden you get into an organization and then that kind of gets thrown out of the window. Um, so I think that's a, I think it's a really important point to, to, to make. And that's obviously part of the journey and part of the development that we're trying to, to instill here. Yeah. And I think, you know, and, and, and you referenced my article and I think one of the most important things that, that you discuss is, uh, or, or that we talk about here is that at no point did I dislike the job. I've loved every job and every opportunity yes. and everything I've been able to to do and, and every day that I was able to positively affect the sports business industry. But there are things that weigh on you that, that go outside of that, that you have to make sure that you make right personally and that you deal with personally um, and, and not let these things affect you so much that they end up affecting that place, which for me in a lot of ways was the sports business arena that they don't start affecting you within that arena because when they do that then and all of a sudden that one safe place starts to get a little bit crowded um that's when you start to have real real struggles and real challenges so i, I think you make you make such a good point there yeah. awesome all right buddy so last question and i ask this at the end of every every one of my podcasts um, because I think it's so important that, you know, the people who listen to this understand this, but what drives you, what gets you up out of bed? What's next for JB? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I think, uh, what, what drives me is, is my, is, is my team and my family. Uh, you know, I, I love coming, I love coming to work every day, knowing that I have 10 individuals, uh, on my, uh, on my sales team that generally, um, are looking to become the best version of themselves, and I think that's just, I think that's just so cool to be around and, and to and to be just a uh, that slice uh, of, of of that journey that they're on right now, and and for me to to be part of that and to see them grow and, and to be in a in a role that they ultimately love, I think is is ultimately what drives me to to make sure I'm on my game. I mean, we've had folks, Brett, who have come straight out of college. We've had individuals who have come from a political background and wanted to transfer into the sports industry. We've had folks who have been in medical sales who have come who come to start in entry level sports sales positions. Why? Because they ultimately want to work in this industry. And I think you know some of them have families. Some of them have really you know fascinating yeah. stories of of being uh, of of being. Uh,